So it, it's been a really good win-win. And that's what I always try to make sure that like, you know, my team and, and I'm looking to grow the team, of course. So any future buyers agents, um, you know, I'm just going to just pump them full of leads and keep them busy, keep them happy and, and teach them how to close the leads. Um, so it's, uh, you know, trying to force success, basically. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of the Passive Cash Flow Podcast, where we discuss in depth topics explaining how we help people passively invest in high demand real estate and why real estate should be a part of everyone's investment portfolio. Some episodes include interesting guests that span dozens of different types of industries. Other episodes offer an analysis of popular topics that pertain to people seeking to learn how to build passive wealth in real estate. So listen in and enjoy our off-the-cuff podcast, not scripted, made to entertain, educate, and help you create passive wealth in real estate. To learn more, visit our website, peoplescapitalgroup.com. But today we have an interesting guest, my good friend that we actually met in college years ago, who is now a top producing real estate agent, Alex Monaco. How are we doing today, Alex? Hey, Aaron. I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to have you on here because um, not only uh, have I seen you raise the ranks of real estate here from being a, 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 a school, a teacher in a school here, and now using those connections to build a, a business in real estate. Now you have buyers, agents, virtual assistants, you're investing in real estate. And I remember, man, when you were just getting started and had so many questions, you know, those types of questions that all those beginners have. And I was like, this kid's either going places or not. And man, oh man, did you prove me right or wrong? Who knows? I'm not <laughs> even sure where I bet my money, but <laughs> you did yep. great, man. You did great. So how did you get started uh, becoming a, a realtor? Yeah. So it's cool how you and I came full circle. You know, we were uh, at, at, back at Rowan and uh, having fun, you know, all that stuff. And then, you know, we sort of refound each other in this new world of real estate. Um, so yeah, I, I was teaching, um, eight years ago and, um, you know, that's what I went to school for. And then I just, you know, wanted to kind of do more and, you know, I had so much time after school and weekends and stuff and summers. So I was looking for something to get into. I was just kind of anxious, you know, I can't really sit still. Um, and I saw, I saw what you were doing on Facebook and I was confused by it, had no idea, but it, it always seemed interesting. So I know I was, I was picking your brain a lot when I, yeah, I was a newbie with no idea what I was doing. And, um, I knew I wanted to kind of invest and maybe be an agent and, um, felt like being an agent would be a good way for me to like learn about investing. Cause I could learn real estate and the transaction process. And then I could kind of get into the investing aspect of it. And it, it really just like worked, got my license and, you know, when I, I started at, at Weikert and there was like excellent training and then, you know, I, I just started to learn. And then each year I just got more and more into it. And um, yeah, it's like crazy how, how it's progressed. And um, now I'm just like full speed ahead and super busy. Did uh, 47 transactions last year in 2021, going wow. for 60 this year. So really, oh, really gosh. loving it. Having fun. That's Awesome, man. 47. That's great. 60 transactions this year. Now, are you finding a lot of realtors these days are saying it's harder than ever to be a realtor because there's just not enough inventory to sell and you're running around like a chicken without a head as a buyer's agent. Heck, even as a listing agent, you have so many offers and showings. It's, it's uh, more work to get that commission check now than ever. Are you finding that's the case? Exactly. It, it is. A, it's brutal. And like, it, it's really hard. And even though like as agents, we're doing well, a lot of us like don't like this and we, we would like it for it's just like be like busy, but like it, it's madness. Um, and as a buyer's agent, I do work with tons of buyers. Uh, it's really hard. And like when I meet with them, I have to have like a, you know, like a hard truth talk and be like, guys, like I can't sugarcoat it. Like it's really competitive. You know, you might be up against 10, 15 plus offers. And, um, you know, if you have a low down payment and other people are paying cash and waiving the appraisal, like you can't compete with that. And we'll do everything we possibly can. And I'm going to help you. But like, I, I can't lie. It might, it might just take a while. So 
you know, I've been able to uh, to move forward and, and do a lot of deals. Um, just find it's been it's been tough and taken a while for buyers. And then and yeah, as a, as a listing agent, it's like, you know, it's just stressful. You have like so many agents calling and people are just like scratching and clawing probes right now. We need more inventory without a doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, so what do you see? The market is like um, slowing down at all. I mean, it's been super hot uh, for a while now. I do see like a little bit of indications on our end that it's kind of um, slowing down a little bit, but it's still hotter than than ever, really. Uh, what do you yeah. see on your ends? Yeah, it was like it seemed like it co- cooled down a little bit in like uh, November, December, like for the holidays. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now 2022 it's already been nuts again like our open houses we're seeing like 30 40 50 plus groups and then like mm-hmm. 10 to 20 offers on homes so right now it feels like how it did like as soon as you know the the pandemic started to calm down and, and people were out going crazy after you know covid so it, it's right back to that where it's just just madness Mm-hmm. No, it, it is uh, pretty wild stuff. You know, the leasing uh, area is crazy as well. We have uh, a lot of demand on the leasing space, which is mm-hmm. good for the landlords, you know, but tough uh, yep. as a tenant, of course, and uh, it causes rent to go up and home prices and everything. Um, and now are you seeing the properties appraised properly uh, with these bidding wars going on? Yeah, it's funny. We've I've been really successful with appraisals still. Haven't had too many issues. Um, it definitely does happen. but. Um, I feel like for the most part, the appraisers are, are, you know, not causing issues. Uh, That's one way of putting it. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it gets really crazy. And when it's in those really crazy situations where it's going like 50 K up, whoever's winning is waiving the appraisal anyway, Mm -hmm. you know, so, or they, you know, they're, they're so qualified, the bank's not even doing an appraisal. Mm -hmm. So you know, I've been fortunate, so I, I don't think it's been particularly a problem. Okay. Yeah, I, I've seen that with a lot of properties recently. The appraisals have been coming out all right. I just sold um, four properties and uh, they all came out pretty well. One of them didn't even have an appraisal. There was a cash offer over list price. I mean, it's crazy yeah. what people are paying for properties. You know, and, and what's funny was I had a couple residential properties that I re- recently um look to refinance and they appraise super low. And I was so upset with the appraiser. I was like, you're way off, man. You're just putting them at the prices I bought them for before renovations. And he was like, well, that's what the worth. I've been in this market for 20 years. So, you know, then I sold them for literally 60% more than the appraisal came out. And I was like, see, you were wrong. I wanted to call up that appraiser and send them the HUD, you know, be like, look how wrong you were. I know. But I, I went on with my life and focused on more important things. I'm petty enough. I, I would call an appraiser afterwards. <laughs> you know, I was like what about to. I mean, I was, it was like six months ago. The guy would be like, who are you? And you <laughs> care. Like, what are you? Okay, fine. You know, I know. They don't care. Yeah, no, he doesn't care. I'm sure he's still under appraising real estate day in and exactly. day out, bragging about how savvy he is of market. Now, you know, And of exactly. course, like the worst, not, not to knock appraisers. I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but I guess I have a an axe to grind me too it's still a very human uh business you know no they, matter no matter what they just think like their say is the final say and like you know they know real estate values better than the open market and right you know they like just call buyers stupid for like paying for and they're like bro you don't even know you don't get it yeah. you're not an investor to be heroes yeah yep. you know and that, that's the problem a lot of people that work in the real estate industry doing things like appraisals or who are in charge of the investment side of, of a business aren't actually investing themselves and right. don't really get it. They may understand how to check off some boxes or measure out the square footage of a home or look up comparable sales and, you know, right. fill out an app, uh, a form, but they don't really understand real estate investment or, or the value of real estate. In my opinion, now, of course, there are many great appraisers out there that know exactly what they're doing and I've met yeah. them as well. So. Yeah, it's oh, frustrating with um, with multifamilies, um, particularly like three and four families where everyone's buying them as an investment, not, you know, not to live in. Um, and and they're, they're calculating the rent and that's how the, the numbers are being determined. But they won't. The appraisers won't consider the rent. They're, they're treating it just like a single family and they're going by the square footage and, mm-hmm. you know, the type of home and things like that. Um, but they, they don't you know, they, they won't factor in the rent at all. And it makes it really difficult. 
Sure, sure. Well, that's called income-based uh, appraisal. Right. Uh, right. And and that is uh, how commercial real estate is appraised. And that's why exactly. I like commercial real estate. And that's the thing, because three and four families are almost, it's almost more like commercial because they're typically being purchased as strictly investment properties, but they won't do um, any income-based. So... Yeah, well, if it's being yeah. purchased through an LLC to be owned as an investment property, then the bank should appraise it as an income uh, appraisal, uh, income strategy appraisal, you know, so income approach. Right. Because uh, at the end of the day, that's the scenario the buyer's purchasing the property in. And that's the intention of the mortgage to give a mortgage to a company, an LLC that's going to own the real estate and cash flow exactly. in the real estate and cover their expenses and pay the mortgage with that that rent coming in. So the rent the building produces is extremely important. And the banks are, in my opinion, wrong to use um, a sales comparison approach, right? Uh, using right. comparable sales um, to analyze the property's value rather than the amount of money it's making, which is the exactly. income approach. You know? Exactly. Um, and, uh, but listen, that's how banks work, right? If it doesn't fit in that box of five units or larger, then we don't do the income approach appraisal, right? And it just right. doesn't make sense to me and you who are in the industry moving the pieces of the monopoly board. But, you know, the people that work at the banks again, right? Yep. Fall into the same category. We, uh, my job is to check off a box. You know, I mean, I've talked to enough bankers to know it's <laughs> everyone's exactly. job is to just do what they got to do in, in the factory line, you know? And right. I just have to get the packet of paperwork to the next person that reviews yep. the packet. I got my supervisor and that's what I'm supposed to do. So yeah, yeah. So they're not really calling the shots. You can't blame really. So. It's all right. So at the end of the day, these are our pet peeves uh, working in the real estate industry. It's become mm -hmm. a therapy session for me and you to <laughs> uh, just complain about all the people we have to deal with in a day. No, but totally. I, I really do. Um, some days I, I miss the grind of the, of being an agent, moving those transactions. You know, I, I <laughs> used to love, you know, closing deals every week. You know, I'm, I'm in the business now raising capital. And instead of closing a deal a week, I'm closing a deal every four to six months. It's a, it's a bit of a different space. Right. Um, but talk about how you keep up with that grind of being a realtor, showing on weekends. Oh, I, the only time I can go out is 730 at night. You know, you just got married. You have a wife. You know, how do you juggle all these things? Yeah, it's um, it's definitely crazy. Um. You know, one thing that's helped me tremendously, though, was um, I hired an assistant, a uh, virtual assistant, actually. Um, and it, it's all back end, you know, the, the paperwork, um, you know, um, simple accounting, things like that. Um, a lot of my like contact management um, and then just doing a lot of e-sign, like like little things like that that go through my email. I've been able to train her to um, to manage that stuff. And it's helped tremendously. You know, I'm still busy with all the appointments and I'm the one, I'm the face of the business, of course, and I'm doing all the showings and things like that. But what's nice about it is then when I get, you know, home from the office, five, six o'clock, like I'm done. Whereas before that, I was, um, you know, coming home at five or six and doing paperwork till 10 o'clock. And, you know, I think my wife was fed up with that. Um, so, you know, definitely that's been a, a huge help um for me and yeah the weekends you know it's it's kind of just it's just like the price you pay you know um for being in this business it's very rewarding there's a lot of great things to it that's one thing that you know i, I don't think i'll be able to change at least not for a long time um you know it's just sacrificing weekends because you know once especially in the spring like i'm gone saturday sunday like all day showing houses yeah, it's the only time people can really see houses, you know, that yeah. or like seven o'clock at night. It's tough, you know. And yeah, they got jobs nine to five. So I, I have to work around it, you know. Sure, sure. I, I'd say that's the main reason that I didn't continue being a real. Well, I, I mean, my passion was always in owning real estate. That's why I got into real estate. That's why I became a realtor was to make some money and, and learn the art of the deal and and, and move on to eventually being an investor. So I want to stay true to my initial goal for getting into real estate and keep my passion moving forward. But the other reason I stopped being a realtor is because <laughs> I couldn't take the hours. They're so hard. It's a lot know? of work. It really yeah. Is. Cause I yeah. like to work like Tuesday, 9am, you know, that's when I'm like go time, you know, like right. I'm on then, you know, or what at nine to five weekdays, like I'm ready to work. I expect to work. That's where I do my best work. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Saturdays, Sundays, I'm just in, in relaxed mode. I'm in family mode now, you know? And yep. so it's, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a lot, it's a mental state there, but that's good. And you also have a buyer's agent as well. And you're developing. Yeah. 
that email. too that too of course yeah I, I hired my first buyer's agent diane she's awesome uh she just closed the deal today actually so very proud of her um but yeah that's that's been another one i i should have said that from the beginning she helps me with showings um, so, you know, when I'm, when I'm overwhelmed and I, I need her help, she, um, is so good and quick to jump in and, um, and help me out with that. So that's definitely helped a lot too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's great. And that's what I, I developed as an agent as well. I got the team going and, you know, I didn't quite structure it the right way though. I, um, I was at Remax as well and I thrived where I went to Remax. I really liked being there, but I, uh, the way I structured my team was I paid their desk fees and, uh, there wasn't really much of an incentive for the agent to go out and, and sell. Um, so hopefully you've structured something smarter than that. You don't have to get into all the nitty gritty of how you structure your team. But you did Definitely. say you changed uh, to Remax and you you started your team there and your name and you felt like that was an improvement for you. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I see so many teams uh, at Remax and, um, you know, in my previous company, I was kind of aspiring to that. And I just felt like I would have the best training for that next step, um, you know, to, to hire a team member. So I made the leap, um, you know, about a year ago, um, hired my first team member and um, just been learning, you know, so much to learn. So th this whole year has been like a major, major growth period for me. It's like a whole nother angle of it to be like, you know, sort of the leader, which is something, you know, I haven't done yet. So um, it's been fun. Definitely. Uh, it's definitely a process and I'm trying to make my checklists and videos and it's, it's so much teaching, um, and, you know, trying to like, remember what it was like when I was new and, um, just trying to figure my way through it and navigate. But, um, yeah, I have a whole, whole structure that I feel like now it's taken me like a whole year where I'm finally like confident in, um, you know, having an agent under me, um, mm -hmm. showing mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. It took me a while to get there a little bit as well, getting started because you yeah. got to learn how to run your business there, how to get enough business coming in to get the phone ringing so that it makes sense to have a, a buyer's agent there. But, um, you yeah. know, that and that made a world of difference. I felt working with buyers took up the most of my time. Really listing yeah. is, is where it's at. If you list, they last, they say, right? Exactly. Yeah. The buyers is, is a lot of work and there's so many buyers now because of the interest rates. Um, so, yeah, I put in a, a whole system where I got leads coming in all the time and I'm just feeding her. Um, and then, yeah, in, in exchange, you know, she, she helps me with showings and, um, you know, I pay her desk fees too. Um, so it, it's been a really good win-win. And that's what I always try to make sure that like, you know, my team and, and I'm looking to grow the team, of course. So any future buyers agents, um, you know, I'm just going to just pump them full of leads and keep them busy, keep them happy and, and teach them how to close the leads. Um, so it's, uh, you know, trying to force success basically. There you go. Hey, yep. it's all about leads, right? You got to have that lead machine. Yeah. Uh, same thing, my, but it's about quality leads as well. Yeah. You know, one thing I've realized in business that it's not too hard to generate leads, get the inbox popping off, but to generate quality leads for exactly yeah. what you're looking to do is, is much harder. And, um, so yeah, we've always, we've had challenges there as well, you know, in the fundraising space, of course, you know, we're not selling a $99 item, you know, we've people invest uh, 30,000, 50,000, a half million dollars, you know, with us. So of course we're looking for a very qualified lead. And, yeah. um, uh, part of my job is to make sure that that's who I'm talking to. Um, yeah. so no, that, that's great. And, and it sounds like you've really been able to, um, uh, almost reach financial freedom. I know you're working your butt off right now. It doesn't feel like it, but you've uh, now gone into investing in real estate. Uh, talk about that and how you've kind of transitioned into that a little bit. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So I um, started with the, the classic, you know, house hacking method, um, you know, just from reading bigger pockets and, and all that, that type of stuff. Um, so bought a two family when I, when I first got my license, uh, got a tenant upstairs and it's been, it, it really was the best way to learn. You know, it's like, it's kind of like training wheels for being a landlord. Yeah. Um, you know, like we had uh, my sister-in-law up there, you know, for the first few, few years. So, you know, it's super easy. Hard um, to evict though. Hard to evict. Yeah, hard to evict, yeah. hard to evict. But luckily uh, uh, you know, she was a great tenant. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's been a great experience and then it helps with my mortgage. So I've been able to keep my expenses very low so that I can take my commission that I'm making and invest into um, more multifamily properties. Uh, definitely used your help along the way, which I appreciate. Um, so yeah, then I got a four family 
um, mm-hmm. in Manville and then recently closed on a, a three family in Boundbrook. Mm-hmm. So now I got a two, a three and a four. Um, I have another three family under contract and then I'm, I'm already looking for, for the next one after that. So yeah, that's, that's been the plan and like it's taken such a long time, but it, it's finally like coming to fruition now, which is like mm-hmm. so cool. Um, yeah. you know, it's really, really working. That's so, awesome. Um, yeah. And are you uh, managing these properties yourself or have you hired a management company or did you just say, Hey wife, take care of my properties? Where, how do you do <laughs> yeah. I I've been doing it myself. Um, it, it hasn't been terrible, but, um, it's also not fun and I, I'm going to hire management. I think once, once I have like two more under my belt, definitely going to hire property management and, you know, outsource that. So I can just focus on my real estate business and selling houses. Mm. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, yeah, it's been good. I, I did, I, I was affected by the flood and, and Ida in one of my, my properties in Manville, um, mm. We lost all the, the mechanicals. None of the apartments were, were damaged, but yeah. So that was uh, for my yeah. first like real one. That was like quite a smack in the face. And, uh, mm. you know, didn't derail <laughs> me too long. I got right back at it. So it's all uh, good. Now. That's good. And it, uh, that, uh, an event like that reminds you why you need to have uh, large reserves and properties. You exactly. Know, it's crazy. Uh, Ida was a, a mess for us as well. We had a number of properties that were not in flood zones that got flood damage. Yeah, mine and- wasn't either. Yeah. Exactly. So weird, you know, I mean, uh, you would expect a property that's not in a flood zone to not necessarily get so much flood damage, but yeah, we yeah. had a number of situations there and then luckily we had reserves to take care of that, but definitely does not help the cash flow of a property or the uh, yeah. income of a property. You know, <laughs> I mean, you could, the silver lining is you get, oh, you get a bunch of new boilers and that helps the, yeah, you know, yeah. We got all good. Heating's working great now. <laughs> But you basically got to refinance to get that money back, you know, it's basically exactly. tied up in the property for indefinitely here. So, exactly. uh, yeah, no, it's a, that's part of the business, man. You know, there's some good days and bad days and Ida was a tough one for us as well. I think a lot of landlords have some pretty nasty stories from that storm. So, um, no more Ida yeah. storms. Let's move on to the next letter of the alphabet for hurricanes. That exactly. Was yeah. I'm ready to exactly. move on to that one. Yeah. Oh boy. But uh, cool, man. Good stuff. So how can people find you if they're looking to buy a home or you do investment properties as well, right? What, what type of real estate do you, do you have? Uh, do you generally trade? Awesome. Yeah. So we're just, you know, full, full service residential real estate. So we help people buy and sell uh, single family homes. And yeah, definitely as being an investor, um, I'm really, you know, skilled with working with investors. I, I know how it goes and most agents do not because they, you know, most, most agents really don't invest. So they, they don't understand it's very different working with someone who's looking to do a flip or someone who's looking to buy a rental. So I have tons of experience with that, that, um, you know, I, I have a lot of clients I've helped flip homes and uh, buy multifamilies that are cash flowing. And it's mm-hmm. been awesome. Like, it's really rewarding. They, they really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, my website's alexmonacorealestate.com. You can look for properties there, get a valuation or, or contact me. And uh, also Instagram at alexmonacorealestate uh, can be reached there, too. Great, great. We'll put those in the show notes for anyone who'd like to get in touch with Alex and his team here looking to buy a property. Uh, but that's great. That's awesome. Man. I'm really glad we had you on the show here. You know, I love talking to people that are in the industry, moving the pieces of the the, uh, monopoly board here, uh, moving the transaction. Realtors, you know, brokers really actually make the market, in in my opinion, especially the residential market, you know, moving all those houses and then in the commercial space too. I mean, the best deals we get right now are pocket listings from really good agents in the commercial space. So it's it's about who, you know, uh, in this business and it has been for a while. Uh, but that's great. So we'll put your contact information in the show notes there so people can get in touch with you. So if you're an active investor, you're looking to take the plunge and own real estate or want to build your portfolios an active investor, then Alex and his team are there to help you find those properties on the MLS or find those properties out there. Maybe he has a pocket listing, which is a listing that's not yet on the MLS, which I know is not always so popular in the residential space. Some, some brokers don't even allow it. I, don't know. Eh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. So what do you have coming up? As you always say, but no, so that's of yeah. course for active investors. 
Now, if you're looking to do the, more of the passive side, that's what people's capital group focuses on. And we help people invest in real estate passively. And we sign the dotted line for the mortgage. We run around and manage the property with our in-house management company. And we send our investors uh, monthly updates and quarterly financials and cash flow checks from the property. And that's what we do here at People's Capital Group. So if you want to qualify or fill out a qualification form to qualify as a passive investor, you can do that at peoplescapitalgroup.com. If you want to buy a property, take the plunge and experience being a landlord, then you can get in touch with Alex here. And Alex, what's your website one more time? alexmonacorealestate.com. Great. We'll put that in the show notes for everyone. Thanks for joining us today and stick around for more episodes of the Passive Cashflow Podcast. Thank you. 